it's made a lot of things quicker and when it comes to like doing proposals and writing things we use it a lot for like fixing grammar and spelling because that's not really a strong point but it's changing everything um, and I think it's it's just a matter of staying up to it on top of it top of it and how we can best use it because you can't you can't stop it cats are big you just gotta <laughs> you just gotta figure out how to implement it in, in all the systems so that's kind of where we're at just you know figuring out how we can use it better and, and going from there and taking advantage of it as best as we can because it's i feel like you're always going to kind of need a graphic designer in some way but how we design is going to be different we may end up just being people that know how to write great prompts Masters of the tool. You have to be masters yeah. of the tool. Yeah. And I think that's the difference um, and why I think a lot of people in our industry have adopted AI quite quickly without the sort of fear and hesitation is because we're used to that constant changing technology. You know, when you're in this field, every program we've talked about today has changed so much in the years that we've been using it, certainly over the last 20 years, but even more so in the last just few. Uh, Hello, we trust you are thriving in your business. Today's guest is a bit of a celebrity in the arts world in Bermuda, although I suspect he doesn't consider himself as such. He's a humble and incredibly talented, mighty creative businessman and poet. We're talking with none other than Stefan Johnson, founder and creative director of SJD World. Laura is so ready to geek out with Stefan about all things design. And if you're into art, into graphic design, into marketing genius, into gorgeous and creative ideas, or if you're into learning how a young man grew his business over 20 years to become a fully fledged design agency in a small and mighty place such as Bermuda, this is your episode. Welcome to Resilient Entrepreneurs, the podcast where we speak with business owners and entrepreneurs from all around the world, from all walks of life, in the hopes that something you hear will leave your business a little richer. We're your co-hosts, Vicky and Laura from Two for One Branding, supporting new entrepreneurs as they launch their business and offering you the tools you need to succeed. It's exactly why we invite experienced, successful entrepreneurs like Stefan to this show to share his wisdom with you on this podcast. Now we ask just one thing from you, if you will. We'd love you to share your love of this podcast by subscribing on whichever platform you're listening or watching on now, and you'll help other startups and business owners to discover the great resource for themselves. This podcast is not like chocolate. There is always enough of resilient entrepreneurs to go around. So let's share it far and wide, by the way, at the time of recording, we are edging on 10,000 downloads. So thank you for getting us there. Now, back to Stefan. Stefan, it's an absolute pleasure to share our platform with you. Are you ready to geek out with us about all things entrepreneurial? Yes, I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Steph. We're so excited to have you here. I always like to start these conversations understanding a bit about, you know, our childhood, our journey, where you started. So your young man grew up in Bermuda. That's pretty interesting. We have a lot of international listeners out there. So I think they'd love to hear what growing up in Bermuda was like and what your childhood experiences were like. Were you an entrepreneurial type kid? What were your parents like? Give us a little bit of that backstory so we understand you a bit better. Yeah, I feel like I, I was a little bit of an entrepreneur growing up. It was kind of a mix of, of I always loved to be creative. I struggled with, I remember I had an art class once and my art teacher told me I had great ideas, but the execution um, wasn't always that great. So when growing up, I loved to be creative in different ways. I did sell art from time to time, but it was, all of this has kind of evolved over the years. It wasn't really kind of a goal to be an entrepreneur. It's just kind of like, hey, this is what's happening. Let's roll with it. <laughs> um, so growing up in Bermuda, you know, it's it's island life. It's a small community and everybody you, you kind of know, everyone kind of looks familiar. I, I didn't know in the beginning what I was doing. Originally, I wanted to be a boat pilot. Um, so uh, I was very interested in learning about waters and I, I wanted to, to study um, everything nautical um, in school. Um, so I was gearing up to go to school to, to study, to, you know, get into that field. And before then I had sailed 
um, on the toll ships because the toll ships had come to Bermuda. And I sailed from Boston to Halifax. So I flew out to Boston and sailed on, the, on a Poland ship. And when I got to Halifax, I purchased a scanner and I brought the scanner back to Bermuda and it wasn't working. So I left it in the corner for a couple months and I was so angry that I spent money on this scanner. I took it apart and I fixed it and I started scanning images and manipulating them. And I've been doing that ever since. The boat idea just went straight out the window. <laughs> and I started to play around with it a little bit more. And then over time I was speaking to different people and one of those people was Laura. And I was like, what is this? What am I doing? I'm trying to figure out what these next things are. I really love manipulating things on the computer. I didn't know what it was called. Um, and everyone was giving me different advice and telling me what it was. And at this point, I still didn't kind of know what I wanted to do. I was caught between leaving this boat pilot idea to computers and images. So I went away to Acadia University for one year where I was just kind of doing general studies. Financially, it was a bear move, but I grew as a person. So <laughs> that was awesome. And when I was there, that's when I actually started conversations with Laura. I'm like, yo, what am I, I don't know what this is called. Like, what am I doing exactly? And she gave me advice on what this is called and, and some schools and amongst other, a few other people were telling me um, what it was. So after Acadia, I moved back Bermuda. I worked here for a year. Um, I was working at Washington Mall Magazine, which was a magazine bookstore here. And what I would do is I was, ordering Photoshop books in, because back then you have books with the CDs in it. Um, I would order them in and whoever purchased it, I was slipping my portfolio in the bags. And that's kind of how I met a lot of the industry here on the island. So people were like, oh, cool. Well, this is what you do. This is where I went to school. Um, and it was really a kind of an undercover hustle where I had a whole, I created a whole section in the bookstore full of like Photoshop, Illustrator, design books. And whoever purchased it, they got my portfolio. Um, and so from there, I went to George Brown College School of Design in Toronto, and that was actually the first time that school made complete sense to me. Like everything just stuck. Like I, it was so weird. Like I'll go to school, go to class, and everything made sense. Like I didn't even have to study afterwards. Everything just started to click. Um, so I was in design school for three years, and then I worked in Toronto around the city for a year. Um, and then decided to come back Bermuda in 2010 to start the business full time. Um, the company actually started online as like an online magazine where I was featuring people, artists, poets, writers, uh, other designers. Started that in 2004, where I was also promoting my work. So I was kind of like promoting my stuff and my portfolio, but also featuring people. So people were coming to check their friends out and also they were getting used to my brand and what I was doing. Um, and it wasn't until I had a one of my professors, we had been nominated for a Webby Award, which was a, a, it's a big online website award and in the student category. And I was telling one of my professors this, and he was like, you know what, this can be your full-time job. And I was like, what do you mean? And that was kind of a light bulb moment where I realized that this is something that I can kind of do and not just a hobby. And from there was a slow shift from kind of just being this thing that I did on the internet called SJD World to be in a, a business. And it was all very organic. It wasn't like after he told me, I just like, oh, I'm gonna start a business. It was kind of like, okay, it was just my whole mindset slowly shift into turning it in, into a business. And yeah, from there, um, I worked in the city for design studio and print shop for three years. And then, um, like I was mentioning, I freelanced around the city for a year and then came back here in 2010 to do it full time. And then, yeah, from then it's, it's been nonstop. I love your story. I love your journey. I love that I was a part of it too. Yes. And yeah, I met Stefan when, yeah, I thought you were in high school, but I guess you had graduated high school. You yeah. already started in university. But I don't think you realize like how cutting edge on the beginning part of the digital design world you were. Like when I started design, I was 16 and I was working in a in-house agency for a retail store. And we were literally like cutting and pasting ads to go in the World Gazette, like in the yes. World Gazette being Bermuda's um, newspaper. And it, it, it seems like such a lifetime ago. It's so insane to know, like it used to take two weeks to design an ad. Like yeah. now it takes two hours. Like yeah. the difference yeah. is drastic. But while I was in university, I started learning Photoshop and then it was Cork Express. We didn't really have InDesign, right? It was like before then. 
And it was such basic stuff I was learning, but I was still doing a lot of hands-on work. By the time you were shifting into university, it had gone so far into the digital world. And you were able to learn that digital design where so many other people were still trying to catch up and figure it out because now we were past university age and now we were trying to learn it. So you had such a unique opportunity to get in there before others. And you know that helped, I think, your rise so quickly because when you did come back to Bermuda, you had the knowledge, some experience by being yeah. outside, which I think is a good lesson for young entrepreneurs and people who want to do something and you come from a small town, like just get out, go see yeah. the bigger world, get experience um, in a big agency and or any any business that you're interested in, get that experience early on and then you can create your own thing. So I love that that's all your journey. And it's just really helped me understand right now just how cutting edge you were. And when you came back to Bermuda, like tell us what it was like to shift into launching your business here. Did you find it difficult? Was it easy? Had you already built up enough name by sharing all those portfolios? I love that story, yeah. by the way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yeah. tell us what launching was like. Like we love yeah. the, the early stages, right? Yeah, so I came back. I remember I, I had a, a broken laptop and I had one bag of clothes and I landed in my basement, my family's basement. And from there, Bermuda's super expensive. so. It was just trying to save up enough money to get, you know, a new computer and then working out the basement. My personal and business was all merged into one, um, trying to have business meetings in my basement bedroom. And this is all before, you know, Zoom and online meetings were really a thing. So it was, I think one of the biggest challenges was getting money to get it going and also convincing people that I'm really doing this. You know what I mean? As things started to grow and I saved money, I began, I rented one of my um, apartment, one of the apartments in my granny's house next door. So she had a vacant apartment. I turned it into an office um, and I started from there and then started to slowly legitimize the company in different ways, um, bringing on different team members. Um, and then after like two, three years in that apartment, then we moved into this um, location here, which is on Front Street in Bermuda. Um, and we've been here for about 10 years. So. The team has grown. There's right now, including myself, there's six of us. Um, there's myself, uh, Talisa, uh, McGlashan, Anna Dill. We've got a new uh, intern, new admin, web support person that we're slowly bringing in. Her name's Raven Walker. And we have two web developers in the south of India, and they've been with me for about 10, 11 years. So it, I think from the basement, it was just very, very hard to, to get the money to legitimize. Um, in Bermuda, it's very hard to, you know, when you're starting out, to be legitimate and run a company is, is hard because all the fees that come with that is, is just not something you can jump into. So I was a pirate for a long time and I'm proud of my pirate status, but as of today, we're 100% legit. <laughs> but we had to, you know, <laughs> avoid things to get it going, you know, because there was no, there's no other way. Like you had to do what you had to do. Um, and my my theory was always, you know, I would I would do things until they told me stop, and I had to pay this and do this, and you know, and it was, yeah. Doing what it takes, right? Doing yeah. what it takes. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I think that's the entrepreneurial way. A lot of us. Uh, often will at the beginning anyway bumble along and just work it out as we go and it's the dream and it's the why that really keeps us going and and calls us in to to keep doing what we love and so when you say it wasn't necessarily legitimate are you saying that you didn't set it up as a corporate entity and maybe didn't pay some of the um, things that we're meant to pay <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, for sure, for sure. And I'm not going to say too much because I'm not sure if there's a statute of limitations yeah, after 20 yeah. years. I don't want anyone yeah. come, coming to chase you down. So. It's one of those things where you, you know you go in and you hit a limit, and they're like, "Okay, you need to do this," and then you got to do what you got to do, and you reach a new level, and you're like, "Okay, it's this is new air up here. Now what I got to do next?" And you just keep on going until someone says, "Hey, up, hold on, hold on, you got to do this." So it was just kind of one of those things, um, which I think is normal for everyone here. Um, Because there's a lot of gray areas on, you know, when you're starting a business and, you know, you're trying to, you're just trying, you're trying to get everything you need and there's only so much that you can do. Um, Mm. I didn't incorporate SJD World until like two years ago. So before it was just a sole proprietorship. 
and we incorporated it because of we started to move in a lot of different spaces and offer um, a lot of different types of services. Um, one of them specifically our subscription model that we've been working on where um, clients can pay for the whole year in advance for unlimited design support, um, which is a high value service, which we've been slowly developing. Um, so those kind of offerings, because it is more, it costs more than the normal things, then, you know, decide to incorporate. And obviously the team got bigger, so um, had to, and our clients got bigger, so we had to protect ourselves um, in that way. But um, yeah, yeah, it's been, yeah. It's, been, it's been a journey. It's been like, okay, figure this out. <laughs> As you do, and I wanted to ask you, how did you learn about business? Because back then, now we can avail ourselves in Bermuda of a number of uh, accelerators for entrepreneurs and, of course, the BEDC, the Bermuda Economic Development Corporation, is Mm -hmm. an opportunity for people to always get the answers that they need if they're starting out in business. How did you learn about business? I'm really just been making it up as I go along. <laughs> I didn't study any business in any school. In 2017, I did take a Streetwise MBA course at the college, which was in partnership with the BEDC, I think at the time. Yeah, so, I recall that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah so that was very interesting for me because by 2017, I was rolling. So taking that course, it was kind of cool because it put names to things that I was doing. So things that I kind of figured out organically, I was like, oh, that's what that's called. And then also talking to other entrepreneurs who are in the course who had problems that I've already solved or they've solved problems that I was having. So for me, it was kind of like you're driving and just cleaning the windshield a little bit like, okay, cool. I know what this is called now or this is how somebody else has solved the problem. But as far as business, I've just made a lot of mistakes and learned from from everything. Like I, I like to say there's no, there's no losses. Um, there's only lessons and a lot of people say that, but it's, it's fact. If you feel like things are falling apart, you just got to, you know, study it, figure out what happened, what went wrong and, and keep it moving. But yeah, it's really just been me making it up as I go along. And that's <laughs> probably beginning, even go back to like going into someone stops me is just kind of figuring it out. Yeah, I, I kind of like that. What what about failure? Because you're just kind of mentioning about making mistakes and learning the lessons. So what is your mindset around failure? And has there ever been like a, a moment where that was it for you? And you're like, maybe I need to go hit a nine to five and forget this business <laughs> thing. I don't, there was never really a moment where I was like, I'll, see an, I'll, I'll hit a nine to five. But there was like brief moments where I'll be like, hmm. I'm not going to do that again. You know what I mean? A lot of times I feel like I've come too far to turn back now. I'm just like, oh man, I've come way too far like to turn that. around. Like it, it's, I like no that. I, I like that. I yeah. turn around now, I'm going to regret it for the rest of my life. So I'll have that thought and I'm like, all right, cool. Let's keep going. But yeah, it's at this point, I'm in way too deep. And I don't think I could work for anyone at this point. But there hasn't been like a hard stop where I'm like, oh, I just feel like giving up. It's been a new challenge because we're into so many different spaces. Like we may fail in something specific, but then also there's been a lot of success in something else that we're doing. So it's always been kind of finding that that balance. How important, Stefan, is partnerships and your team that you've built? Yeah, team is super important. Um, I feel like that's one of the things that I'm most proud of um, because, you know, it's only so much that one person can do in a day. Um, so having a, a, a great team around you, you know, only, you know, pushes the company forward and supports you. So I don't go too crazy. Uh, <laughs> so the team is super important. That's one of the most things that I'm, I'm proud of, the people that I have around me. Um, and the majority of people around me, they've been around me for years. So um, it's, we don't have a big turnover rate. So I've been very lucky with, with the people that I've been able to hire. Um, so that's been super important. I don't think it's anything to do with luck. I think it's a lot to do with culture and culture is led from the top. So it's the culture that you create for your business. So talk to us about that. Like what's important to you? What do you value value most in your business and and sort of in life in general? Balance is super important. I feel like everyone that's on the team is opposite of me in some way. So they bring something to the table because I know my strengths and my weaknesses. So I think that's super important to understand where you are weak and, and recognize that. And then bringing on people that complement your weaknesses. Because if 
if everyone on the team thinks the same, has the same experiences, has the same strengths, then there's going to be areas where there's going to be, you know, blind spots. So everyone on the team has different perspectives. And I like the fact that when we leave the office or we put down SJD World for the day, everyone goes off, has different experiences, you know, live different lives. And then we come back to the table and we all see things differently and can bring different perspectives. So that's super important to me. And also that they're, everyone's job is flexible. Um, I'm not super strict, like even the designers that are on the team, I encourage them to have to do freelance, you know, as long as it's not too much in the office or on, on my system. But I feel like that's important that, that as designers, we go out there and, and make mistakes. And then you learn from your personal clients and then you bring it back to the company. That's how I built myself. Like I, I designed a lot for um, interns. I interned with a lot of agencies as well. While I was interning, I was doing freelance work as well. So um, I think that was super important because I made a lot of mistakes along the way um, in my freelance work. So when I came back to the agency, it was, oh, I went through this before. I think that is super important. And it's weird because I know working with a lot of agencies to like non-compete, but max out your time. Go ahead, make all the mistakes you can and then come back here <laughs> and you don't have to make those mistakes with me. <laughs> I 100% support that. And I think it's really, um, there's a lot of people out there, I'm sure listening here that, you know, maybe have a nine to five and they're just sort of in the stage of having a hustle and wanting to turn it into a full-time career because that's how a lot of us start out as entrepreneurs. So maybe we have a full-time job. My story is I got made redundant while working and I had freelance, I was freelancing for a few other clients. And I was like, well, maybe if I can figure out how to turn this freelancing thing into more of a full-time gig. Yeah. And absolutely, that's exactly how my journey started into entrepreneurship. So yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. I totally agree. And most people have to hide it. Like most yeah. people have to hide their side hustle, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I love your mindset. I think that's really key. And giving your employees the permission to explore and figure out different things. And, and often like you, I bet they're doing other things besides yeah, just graphic design so yeah. let's talk about your uh side hustles <laughs> that you have beyond running a very successful agency but you're also a poet you're an yeah. actor let's <laughs> talk a little bit about your poetry because i think you were designing like cd covers for your poetry when i first yeah. met you too so you yeah, were doing yeah. that way way back then so tell us a little about poetry and what that means to you yeah, so I've released three poetry albums. Um, my last one was in 2011. I haven't done a lot since then because I've been building the company. But it's it's another passion of mine. And I, I love putting together the albums because it uses both sides of my brain. So I was able to write it and then put together all the album artwork. So back when we were putting out CDs, you do the whole album package and, and all the promotional material. And I was writing it. The only thing that I wasn't doing was actually the recording um, aspect. I knew nothing about that. So um, my good friend, James Brooks, um, I brought him on to partnered with putting together the albums. Um, so the albums to me, in reference to the company, I, I see the company as kind of like a plant in the albums and the poetry was like flower and a fruit, where it's not something that always comes out, but when it does, it's, it's, it's great. And it, it uses both sides of my mind. So I really get off on doing the, the poetry, writing, recording, and the design element of it all. So over the past 13 years, I haven't really been doing as much as I have in the past, but I've been trying to do different things with my catalog. So last year specifically, we put out a short film called Bermudian Poet um, with another friend of mine named uh, Mark Dal Rodriguez. And we're about to release May 24th, which is a, a big Bermudian holiday here, a short film um, called Thoughts Become Things, which is about a young Gumbe. Gumbe is a, a, a native cultural figure here in Bermuda who goes to sleep one night and meets his ancestors, um, which we're super excited about. And I don't like to speak a lot about projects before they come out, but this one, um, there's something very special about it. Uh, we were able to involve uh, six Gumbe troops at the time that was all the troops on the island. Now I believe there's two more that have come out since we finished shooting. So it's, it's very, very, very special. And I'm excited for that one to be released. So the poetry is something that's kind of ever evolving and I bring it out from time to time on different things. It's kind of like when I'm in the moment or when things happen or it's a very spiritual craft. So it's not something that I do 
for commercial use. It's not like you know people hire me to do it. That's never really been the vibe for the poetry. It's been kind of therapeutic in a way. More and the you know the graphic design is kind of the commercial thing that I do. Um, yeah. And my my friend James had to actually convince me to sell the albums. I I wanted to just give them away for free. <laughs> he was like, "Nah, we gotta sell it." I was like, "Eh, I don't know, man." <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I hope to revisit the album thing again one day. But for now, it's just been kind of the short films and um, finding out other ways that I can bring the poetry to life. Yeah, it sounds like the poetry and the films are such an expression of yourself and really sharing who you are um, yeah. behind the business face. I've done business with you for many years, Stefan. And um, I always find that I don't get some fake business front. I always feel like we're connecting. And yep. I think that's so special to do business with someone where you feel an authentic connection. Yet perhaps the poetry and the and the film takes it to another level. Yeah. And you're, you're sharing your deepest uh, creative juices. And so it's kind of hard to put a price to that and then yeah, look to yeah. sell it. And I think yeah. that's what artists often go through. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. And, yeah. and what I like about it also is as designers and working with clients, you're restricted a lot of times. I mean, even, you know, you do something and you think it's the greatest thing in the world and then clients are like, nah, that's mock. So <laughs> we also mock, you know, not, not great. <laughs> but, yeah. Translation. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So those kind of projects, those experimental projects that that the company does, um, it helps us to continue to be creative. So the company, we also have an online shop where we sell stuff that we create. Way down the line, I, I hope to the company gets in a space where we are servicing. We're not servicing as many clients as we are now, but we're just kind of creating cool things and being able to sell them online. Right now, the services obviously is the backbone of the company, but... I'm an artist, so eventually I like to get to a space where we're just creating what we want to create and we're selling and we're able to make a living doing it that way. Um, and that could be a range of things from WordPress plugins to art, to digital art, to t-shirts, to books, to doing short films and all those kinds of things is what um, I would love SGD World to move more in the direction of um, than servicing a million people. You know, I am an entrepreneur, but I also have a million bosses there's a, <laughs> every client is like an individual boss and there's a lot of times where clients want to create things that are not that great and no matter how much you try to convince them otherwise it's what they want so it is what it is <laughs> Ooh, let's talk into this this is a shared pain come on let's go there it's not a big session it's really just understanding the limits of yeah. when you work for a client how far do we push this is yeah. going to be useful for any business, any business person listening. How far do you push towards your expertise? Mm -hmm. And how far do you say you're the client, you can have what you want? Yeah, you know, we'll tell you something two or three times. And then after that, we tap out. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> all right, well, it is what it is. Here's the invoice. <laughs> <laughs> Let, the, talking about invoice, I think that brings up a good point because people will say online, I've heard this over and over, and I believe this to be true too, that the more you charge a client, the better the yes, the quicker the yes. Yeah. Because there's a difference between a low budget client and a high budget client. Let's talk about that a little bit. Like in your experience, when you're doing the bigger projects with the bigger clients that have the higher budgets, are they hiring your expertise primarily. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think they put you up as the expert because your price is up there too. So yeah. for those starting out or, you know, the beginning stages and can't figure out pricing, right? Mm -hmm. That is the biggest stress. And it's hard when you begin because you don't know where yeah, you yeah. are yeah. and where you land in the rest of the, you know, ecosphere. But like, talk about that, like the difference between a low budget and high budget project and how, how are they different? Yeah. So usually the, the high budget projects majority of them clients you know take our advice um and a lot of times it is easier to work with some of the low budget clients even the ones that we do favors for they become very difficult um when as we started to increase the pricing we did uh the headaches slowed down a little bit uh because you know we started to only attract people that were serious 
some people will call me in, um, we'll tell the pricing, they're like, no, it's okay, we'll find somebody else. I'm like, all right, great. Let's keep it moving because it's not, you know, it's not worth it if we do it for any cheaper. So it's, I think it is definitely a balance. But then you do get those high pricing clients that are a little bit difficult, especially if it's boards or a group of people that everyone's got to input on. And then you get the high price clients that are difficult to pay sometimes. They may pay the first couple of invoices, but then after a while, you're like, come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> come on, you got a whole department to deal with this. <laughs> um, so it's an interesting balance. And then there's some clients that just have a whole bunch of money and then just pay the whole full invoice and then disappear for a year. And then they'll come back and they'll be like, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> So it's, yeah, it's been interesting. I think that's part of the ride, right? That's part of the entrepreneurial ride is figuring out clients and working with yeah. clients. It's, it's a fun challenge. It's yeah, a fun yeah. challenge. Definitely understanding where you stand, your pricing, not negotiating too, like selling yourself cheap and learning how to say no, because some projects are just not, just not worth it. I really it's like that natural you. filter that you were talking yeah. about. The pricing becomes the natural filter. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're only attracting the people who are serious about yeah. getting this done to a quality standard that you will deliver. Yeah. If yeah. they just yeah. want to push something out and they don't aren't so mindful of the quality, then they can get that pretty much anywhere yeah. and they will. Yeah. So I love that you know where you're at. Of course, I would certainly hope you did after this many years. Yeah. But um, for people who are starting in business, believe in yourself. Trust that the quality of your work is what you say it is. Trust that you're adding value to your client's life and to their business, whatever business it is that you're in, and charge accordingly. Yeah. So like on, for us, on average, we're working on between 90 to 150 projects at once. So one client could be four or five projects. So it would be a logo, business card, brochure. And then we've, we've built hundreds and hundreds of websites, but we offer website maintenance plans and we monitor like 25 on a monthly basis, which is a lot for a small team. So we're doing that. And then we print locally and overseas. So we've got stuff printed in China and the States and Canada. So we're also dealing with shipping logistics, bringing things in. Then we've got like, you know, 10 clients that have disappeared or gone ghost on us. So we've got the projects in all different phases and stages. So when there is a client that comes in and they're like, oh, I'm not sure about the price. And I'm like, all right, cool. Well, you know, we'll constantly got things that would turn it over and trying to avoid, you know, headaches as much as possible. <laughs> so it's it's definitely being able to, to set, set that standard on the type of client we want. I re refer people a lot. So maybe it's a, a web project that I feel it's too big for us. And I'm like, okay, talk to this company because this is not something that, that we can take on. They're like, sure, you're really referring us? Yeah, I'm really, really referring you <laughs> to somebody else. Because it's this is not it's not something that we're willing to to take on. Because a lot of times they may clog up the whole our whole operation. And I have to dedicate way too many resources to it, which would, you know, slow us up with everything else that we're working on. That has to be such an important lesson. I really hope people heard that loud and clear I re if you didn't rewind <laughs> listen again because that is key and it can take years to get to that stage of really yeah. knowing what works for your business and what doesn't how yeah, long did it yeah. take you to kind of come to that place of really understanding what is your sweet spot um I think it's hard to say it's everything has been kind of an organic process I feel like as the team has started to grow and as the accounting has started to become more sophisticated and I'm able to really measure what I'm paying out, how much these things are going to cost. Then I'm, I kind of get a better idea after I've been able to study, get better analytics. Like, you know what? This is not, this is not worth it. Um, it's costing this much. We're spending this much time and it's giving us this many headaches. So yeah, let's not do that again. <laughs> so trial and being a yeah, trial and error and, you know, getting those analytics and really studying what we're doing, how we're doing it, how much it's costing um, has been super important to making those decisions on what projects are most valuable and what makes the most sense. Because obviously we do, you know, do favors for people from time to time. That's been a big part of really extending the network um, and even doing trades, 
service traits like you know you do this we'll do this for you if you do this for us type of thing but being able to you know how many of those you're taking on at once and based on what the workload is like in the studio is is also very very important to have that balance back to balance again everything is about balance can you share with us a couple of trade secrets what are you using as far as systems are concerned how do you keep your uh your operations flowing it's evolved a lot over the years today for project management we use a software called teamwork and that's been amazing so as the team evolved and we got bigger and some of the team members are remote obviously and we started to venture into a whole lot of different things we started using a combination of excel um, a software called harvest for time tracking and basecamp and those were kind of the three go-tos but then basecamp started to become too slow um, harvest was awesome and i highly recommend any freelancer to use harvest for time tracking um, but then obviously excel was too slow so i was looking for a system that can do everything in one and spent like a good part of a year searching and experimenting with different platforms but teamwork.com they do everything. This is like a commercial for them because it's, it's the best thing ever. It's got calendar integration, task assignment, project assignment, time tracking. We do everything through there. So as far as project management, we use teamwork.com, QuickBooks for accounting, one password for password keeping, and Slack, Slack for internal communication between the teams and using Slack channels for the specific teams. And I guess you could say departments. So those are our, our main kind of go-tos right now as far as like project management. And then obviously on the design side, you know, Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign. Um, and I dare say, yes. But, no, you're using Canva. Tell me, are you using Canva? Uh, uh, I hate that we are talking about this, but yes, there is a little bit of it here. <laughs> I love it. Very, no judgment very, in this room. A very resistant to it. Uh, I was so resistant to Sam. I was like, hell no. I'm a pure designer. I am Adobe and I'm still Adobe. I use all the Adobe system absolutely for big jobs, big projects. But when it comes to digital work, oh, Canva's king. Canva's pretty I mean, amazing. For us, I think what, what has really caused us to move a little bit in that direction is because a lot of people are coming to us with stuff that they've done in Canva and they're like, oh, I did this logo in Canva, but it won't print properly. So we would have to take it apart um, and, and fix it. Um, or with a lot of our web clients, if they're not on our maintenance plans, they want to be able to manage their website themselves and they're doing all their social themselves. So Canva has been an alternative where we would have to create templates for them in it. And then they were able to, to run it themselves. But overall, I think Canva's doing the most. It, they're doing a lot. Um, everything from like, you know, AI, they're doing web hosting and it's, it's a lot. It's a lot happening. Yes, there. Stefan, move over because we do intend to interview the CEO, <laughs> founder of Canva. <laughs> we do intend that. So if you're listening. She's on our wish list. She's on our wish list. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, we, we use it. I'm still, you know, a little resistant and the team's like, yeah, let's do it. I'm like, yeah, okay. But I'm a I'm a graphic design true. So yeah. um it is what it is. The the industry is evolving. I was actually speaking at MSA high school here um on last Thursday, I think it was. And going back to the conversation of Laura, like when you were saying coming into graphic design and it was the computer age and everyone was getting into computers. And now I'm speaking to them and they're coming into graphic design and it's the AI age where it may have taken me 30 minutes to an hour to cut somebody out of a photo. And now it's like, you know, you could just double click on your phone or, you know, Photoshop has that already built in and where it's all kind of instant where it, that is a huge shift when it comes on this side, cause everything can be done so quickly now, um, where it is almost like the shift into computer age. Where now mm -hmm. AI is is just as huge of a shift um, coming into the industry. How do you see AI changing your workplace and the type of work that you do? It's made a lot of things quicker. And when it comes to like doing proposals and writing things, we use it a lot for like fixing grammar and spelling because that's not really a strong point. But it's changing everything. 
Um, and I think it's it's just a matter of staying up to on top of the top of it and how we can best use it because you can't you can't stop it. The cat's out of the bag. You just gotta <laughs> you just gotta figure out how to implement it in, in all the systems. So that's kind of where we're at. Just you know figuring out how we can use it better and and going from there and taking advantage of it as best as we can. Because uh, it's I feel like you're always gonna kind of need a graphic designer in some way but how we design is going to be different we may end up just being people that you know know how to write great prompts masters but, of know. the tool you have to be masters yeah. of the tool right? yeah. and i think that's the difference um and why i think a lot of people in our industry have adopted ai quite quickly without the sort of fear and hesitation is because we're used to that constant changing technology yeah. You know, when you're in this field, every program we've talked about today has changed so much in the years that we've been using it, certainly over the last 20 years, but even more so in the last just few. Mm-hmm. And um, and I was going to ask you about AI too and, and how you felt about it. And it didn't surprise me that that was your response because yeah. I think you're right. The cat's out of the bag. It, it is what it is. These kids coming out of school now, yeah. like they've, they're coming into a totally different world. And if they're going into a creative field, it's going to be throughout their yes. field. So how do you adopt it? How do you use it? How do you become great at it? And how do you become the master of the tool? Because yeah. then there's going to be people using other tools and in other businesses, and they're not going to be masters of that tool. So you're going to get yeah. hired because you're great at it. No matter if it takes you two hours or 20 minutes, that's that's not going to be the issue. Yeah. But we're yeah. probably going to produce a substantial amount of quantity of work that we weren't able to um, in the future. And that's going to be interesting. But one thing I do believe, I believe this strongly, is that people are always going to want entertainment. Always. And visual arts and entertainment, acting, music, poetry. People are always going to want that because why? Because we need escape from the treasury of life and the nine to five and the worksheets and whatever you might be doing. The creative arts is what brings us that escape, whether you just love to go to the movies or you like to read or yeah. so that won't change. The desire for that won't change, but certainly how we produce it, I think yeah. is, yeah. is and, really going to change. And I think there's always going to be people that who are not creative and just don't have the time and just don't even want to, even if AI is involved and they just have to type a prompt, there's people that are just not going to want to do it. We are here to service those people. So using whatever tools we have to use and, if it is easier for us and I can still charge you the hour, then sure. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe, but speaking about that, charging the hour, right? Well, maybe that's what really needs to change in our industry. Yeah. So charging by the hour when you can produce 20 projects in an hour versus mm-hmm. one yeah, or yeah. half one. Yeah. I mean, like you know, the management of that amount of clients and that amount of work is what's going to take up more time than the creation of that work, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. how do we charge for things? How do we change that mindset from dollar per hour to project-based pricing? What's your thoughts on that? So for us, everything is based on time. So when the designers come in, you have your list of projects and for each project has a stopwatch. So it's start and stop, start and stop. And then at the end of the month, I run a report and pay you based on the time that you have clocked. So it is based per hour, but it is also per project. So if you've, We've only clocked 15 minutes or 20 minutes, then that's what the clients can get charged on. So it's more incremental now where it's not just an hour. I mean, we could charge for 35 minutes. I mean, I'll, you know, obviously if it's close to an hour, we'll round it up close to 40, you know, the, the increments would be 50 and 30, 45 and an hour. And we're able to supply reports if client wants, if a client wants it. Where back in the day before the online uh, timekeeping, it'll be like, okay, this, this project is an hour. I'm gonna write it in a project folder. <laughs> and then submit it to the account manager where everything is literally tracked down to the minute on this side. So guys, what do you think about charging for value, not time at all? What the project is actually worth? Yeah. yeah. Not worth based on how long it took you, but yeah. the value it brings to your client. I think when, when it comes down to the pricing on our end, there is a bit of that as well. So when at the end of the month, for our bigger clients when, you know, we'll run a report and see how much time was clocked by the team, you know, based on the team members experience and level, I'll look at that. And then maybe one of the designers clocked 50 hours on a project and that 50 hours 
is based on the rate that I'm paying them. And the studio rate is obviously a lot higher. So you value that out. And I may not charge the client 50 hours, may charge them 40 hours, but the client, the company's still making money based on whatever that is. So it comes down to the pricing for me, like based on how much time was clocked, the complexity of the project, who was working on it. Um, so it is kind of a, a mm. big calculation on, on this side and where value is added, where it is this base per hour, but also how complex was this? How long it took us to, to learn how to do this task? And then what is fair also. All right. So my takeaway from this whole conversation is that there's no cookie cutter pricing. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> no, no. We just need to work it out for ourselves. What feels right for us as yeah, business yeah. owners and what feels right for our clients. And yeah. again, who we're niching to, who our target market is, that will change depending on who our client is. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, but thanks for being so transparent with all of this. My goodness. Yeah. And and also thank you for your generosity in sharing your operating systems that you yeah. use. Like you said, it took you a year or more to really yeah, yeah. work out what was going to work for you. And that's just golden yeah. advice for anyone who's listening. If they want to try that out, then go for, for me, it. It's, uh, the sword don't make the samurai. So <laughs> it's a good saying. I like that. <laughs> it's true. We use all our tools, but you know, I feel like our team is special, and you know, we create cool things. So you know, I like to keep a very transparent atmosphere over here. And it took us a while to to find certain tools, but hey, they're great. It is what Thank it you. Is. What do you love most about being an entrepreneur? Uh, my freedom. If I feel and find a need to travel, I can. I can do what I want to do when I want to do it. If I need to stay home and work from home, I don't really do that much because I've you know, designed this studio. It's completely comfortable and it has everything I need for what I want to do. And I've made a very clear separation between work and home. But if I wanted to, then you know, I could. Um, if I want to leave at any particular time, you know, I could. Just the freedom. I think that's, that's the best part. Obviously, it has its headaches and it stresses, but I think the freedom and every day is on purpose. For me, it's it's kind of a thing to live by. Like it's, you know, laying a brick every day for the future. I'm going to do this because in the future, this is going to help me here um, and planting seeds in different, different ways and different things. Um, and then it eventually all comes together. So, so speaking of the future, any big audacious goals for your future? Not too big. I mean, it's been interesting because I get asked that question a lot. Like, what's the, the end goal? And it's mostly been about the journey here where it's like, oh, I want to do this or let's try to do this or let's do a short film or let's bring on another person or this feels right. Let's kind of move in this way. I think eventually, like I was saying before, I would like to get a place where we're just creating and selling and we're making money off of things that we create and not servicing so many people. So I think that will be the eventual shift slowly. But when, I don't know, hopefully before I'm 65. <laughs> so when I'm 65, I'm just, you know, just chilling and just making money off of things that we create. Um, but until then, it's just, just enjoying the ride and continue to make the company as stable as possible. Yeah, I love that. And parents out there uh, want to let you know that there are ways for your creative children to make a very good living. So perhaps encourage the art classes or the music classes or whatever it is, because there is a great life out here. Those of us who have turned this into a career can attest. And Steph and I have a very similar career. Steph went into more of an agency model, whereas I've stayed more on the freelance before building this business with Vicky that I love so much. And we have this amazing opportunity to talk to incredible people like Stefan, who's 20 years in the business. I mean, wow. And being a creative is, is challenging. It's very vulnerable because everything yeah. you create is a little bit of you, especially in your, your more external pursuits rather than yeah. graphic design can be fairly safe because you're working with a yeah. client and they're going to give you some parameters and you're going to work yeah. within them. You don't push boundaries too hard in that field, but certainly creating uh, poetry and speaking yeah. that. And I know you've spoken live and I, yeah. you're also an actor and you've yeah. you know, yes, done yes. performances and you know all of that's quite vulnerable because you're putting yourself out out there. So all of that takes a good bit of resilience. And as we are Resilient Entrepreneurs Podcast, we always like to ask you what your opinion of resilience is and uh, how does one become resilient? How do you get to where you are? I feel like it's just learning to get back up because, you know, you get knocked down, um, 
but learning from those lessons, learning from those failures, there's no failures, there's only lessons. And once you get knocked down, just, you know, getting back up again, just keep on getting back up. That's, that's the best way to, to describe it. Cause you're going to lose a lot of money. You're going to make a lot of mistakes, but it's a part of the process. <laughs> I've lost a lot of money, <laughs> but Hey, it is what it is. This is the journey that you're on and it's something to expect. You just got to realize that and just get your mind in a place where like, this is going to happen. You're going to fail. So get used to it and people, and you know, not everyone's going to be happy with some of the moves and decisions and things that you make, but Hey, this is just the journey that, that you're on. Just got to get back up and keep going. Is there anyone that um, helped you like get up on that journey, a mentor or partner, anybody that's, that helped you? That's another question I get asked too. And I, I've always wanted to find one mentor, but I, I haven't. It's always, I feel like there's always been different people that's drop nuggets of gold on me like you Laura in the past different people along the way just say hey try this or do this or maybe you should try this but it's never really been one person that I've come across that has been on the exact same journey doing the exact same things and I've always been like oh man I wish I had a mentor to teach me this and then I figure it out for myself and I'm like huh okay well let's keep going and then I get to another level and I'm like oh man I wish I had someone to show me this and then I figure it out for myself so I've always kind of wanted someone to show up but they just never never have so just keep on moving. <laughs> well, not yet. You're still young, Stefan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you've got a lot to give the next generation. I know you've taken on interns recently, which is kind of new yeah. for you. And, um, and I'm sure they've learned tremendous amount just being in your space, within your team. I know you do have an amazing team. A shout out to Anna, a friend of yes. mine as well. Uh, we love you, Anna. And certainly we appreciate you and everybody who listens today or watches this on YouTube is going to get something from it because you've shared so many great lessons, the figuring it out, the bootstrapping it, the, you know, not being afraid to take the risk, the building a team and the importance of building a great team, the right team and, and setting up a great culture for them to, you know, not just do great work, but want to be there, want to be working with you and, yeah, yeah. and building with you. Right. I think that's so key. So, so many great life lessons in this you know, podcast today and can't thank you enough for your time. I know you're oh, super you. busy and we really appreciate it and, uh, and everything you do to keep giving back and sharing your great creative talents with the world. And we're looking forward to May 24th. Um, yes. it'll be out on YouTube. I believe yeah, you, yeah, you said, so we may have to share that. We will yeah. share that with our listeners and it comes out and people can watch and check it out. I'm really excited yeah. for that. Excited for you. Have, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we also have um, this Friday, we're having a gallery show at Bermuda Society of Arts um, featuring some of the projects from over the past 20 years. Um, the show will be out from March 1st to March 23rd. So this week has been, we're gearing up for that. And then once that show goes up, then the focus is going to go back around to the short film. And then after that, I'm going to be chilling out for the rest of 2024 because I went really hard in 2023. <laughs> so I'm going to take a little breather. Um, but yeah, so we're excited about those two big projects that are, that are coming on. Amazing. Amazing. What does chilling out look like for you, Stefan? Last year, we did a lot of external projects, so stuff outside of the services. So chilling out would be, you know, focused mostly on internal processes with the company, not doing so many films and um, external projects and, you know, not being so much out there and spending, you know, more time with family, traveling a little bit um, in that kind of way. Okay. Uh, 2023, the goal was to do the most and I definitely did the most. So, um, <laughs> I prefer to operate in like waves where, you know, where things got crazy, but then, you know, it, it quiets down a little bit. We able to catch ourselves, regroup, reorganize. Um, and then turn things up again. Um, I'm not a big fan of when things are steady, like crazy, busy, constantly for years, years, years on end, because you get burnt out, especially as artists and designers, that, that's not healthy. But 2023, the experiment was to try and test the limits on everything. So that's what we did. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And I think that's another good lesson right there. The waves, I do think um, entrepreneurship is a roller coaster. Yeah. And you sometimes you have to grind hard and, and sometimes you have to rest and recuperate yeah. and, and keep building because, yeah, being creative is exhausting because you're constantly in your brain. That's the thing about being an entrepreneur. You never really turn off. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's really hard to clock out at five o'clock and just 
forget about work until 9 a.m. Because even yeah. if you can leave your studio, which I love yeah. that you have a studio and you have that escape, even when you leave it, it doesn't leave you necessarily. Yeah. It's cool, but the, the separation is definitely important too. Yeah. Definitely for me, it was important. It's been about 10 years I've removed my cell phone from everything. So if you have my cell phone out there, uh, it's very sacred. Don't hit me up with cell phone about work. Like as soon as I leave this room, if you can't reach it, you got to put it in email. You can call the office line and leave a voice message if you want to. But as soon as I leave this this space to try my best to disconnect, I don't even have the computing power at home on purpose. Yeah. So, Good. Yeah. Nice. Thanks for having me, guys. Thank you. <laughs> it's been an amazing conversation with you, Steph. Thank you so much for your generosity and your insights. And we look forward to keeping tabs on all these great things you have coming out. And we will see you really soon. So thanks for being on Resilient Entrepreneurs. We appreciate you. And that's a wrap for today's episode of Resilient Entrepreneurs. We hope you enjoyed hearing from our amazing guest and learn something new about resilience and entrepreneurship. Remember, resilience isn't just a trait, it's a skill that can be learned and developed. And if you want to stay connected with us and hear more inspiring stories, be sure to hit that subscribe button and follow us on social media. And if you know somebody who's a resilient entrepreneur and would be a great guest on our show, we want to hear from you. Please reach out. Thanks for tuning in and we'll catch you on the next episode of Resilient Entrepreneurs.